Welcome back to Real Nutrition Basics, a free video series that helps you create simple but powerful healthy eating habits so that you can start to experience the many health benefits of natural, minimally processed, nourishing foods and beverages. So in this lesson, we are going to focus on one of the most widely consumed food groups, and that is fats and oils. Because as it turns out, not all fats and oils are made equal. And so it's really important that you know exactly what to avoid and why, as well as what to focus on moving forward, especially if you are someone who practices the high fat approach to eating. Good. So without further delay, let's dive into lesson five. Now, just for the sake of clarity, let's begin by reminding ourselves that fats and oils, also known as lipids, are one of the three macronutrients necessary in human nutrition. And so, as you may already know, fats are very important to the nervous system. They also help the body use fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. Fats are also important in the manufacture of the steroid and sex hormones. And you might also know that fats are the most concentrated source of energy, providing more than double the energy content of carbohydrates or protein. Ultimately, each body cell is dependent on lipids for its health because lipids are a vital part of the membrane that surrounds each cell of the body. And since your body consists of trillions of cells, it makes sense that we should learn how to make nourishing fat and oil choices for the sake of our health. So let's now discuss what fats and oils are best to avoid and why so that you can protect yourself and your family from the negative health effects that can come with high consumption of toxic fats and oils. And just for the sake of clarity, please note that by fats, I'm referring to dietary fats, which are solid at room temperature, whereas oils are simply liquids. Good. So the top red flag products in the fat and oil category that are best to avoid include a group of highly processed products, also known as industrial seed and vegetable oils. So think corn, canola, cottonseed oils, as well as soybean, safflower and sunflower oils, including grapeseed and rice bran oils. So the main reason why I personally choose to avoid all of these vegetable oils as much as I can is primarily because of the harsh manufacturing practices these modern oils undergo, which involves high pressures, high temperatures, including toxic petroleum-based solvents like hexane that is used in oil extraction to pull the oil from the seeds, including other chemicals to deodorize the oils in order to get rid of the off-putting smell from the chemical processing. In other words, these heavily processed vegetable oils are not the type of products that you want to load your body with. Not only because the valuable nutrients and antioxidants naturally present in seeds are destroyed as a result of these damaging processing factors, but these nutrient-poor oils are ultimately toxic to your body because of the chemical residues and oxidized byproducts they contain. Ultimately, a high consumption of industrial seed oils leads to causing problems in the body, such as liver and reproductive damage, as well as free radical formation and inflammation, which links to cancer, weight problems, heart disease, and more. In addition, high consumption of refined vegetable and seed oils leads to an imbalanced ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 essential fatty acids, which is not ideal because nearly all chemical communication throughout the body depends at least in part on the correct balance between omega-6s and omega-3s. In other words, these essential fatty acids, also known as vitamin F, play an important role in nutrition, health and disease, and because our bodies cannot make them, hence the adjective essential, we have to make sure that we get our omega-3s and omega-6 through specific foods. Now, with that being said, it's important to recognize that in the typical Western approach to eating, it's much easier for us to get the omega-6 essential fatty acids than the omega-3s. And so if we are not careful, then we can create a situation in the body where the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is too high, which can then lead to omega-3 deficiencies, 
depending on your overall diet. And so as a result, we can contribute to excess inflammation in the body and therefore increase our risk for developing chronic diseases, including cancer, which is why I highly recommend that you remove these heavily processed vegetable oils from your kitchen, including industrially produced trans fatty acids, also known as trans fats, which you can find in industrially produced fats such as margarine and shortenings, which are even worse for you than the industrial seed oils that we just discussed. Now, for the sake of clarity, be aware that we can find small amounts of trans fats in meat and dairy products because ruminant animals like cattle and sheep can form them naturally when bacteria in these animal stomachs digest grass. But since we need more research on the health impacts of consuming natural trans fats, let's now focus on what we know for sure. And that is that industrially produced trans fats are the worst type of dietary fat that you can put into your body. See, industrially produced trans fats are created in an industrial process called partial hydrogenation, which adds hydrogen to liquid vegetable oils to turn them into solids at room temperature, as well as to prolong shelf life and save production cost. Now, the good news is that we've come to recognize that these artificial trans fats offer zero nutritional benefits, but they are also damaging to our health, especially the heart. And so you may already be aware of the global efforts to reduce the rising rates of heart disease associated with high intake of partially hydrogenated oils, which are actually the biggest source of industrially produced trans fats. Another piece of good news is that many countries have already implemented the best practice policies set by the World Health Organization, such as Canada and the USA, both of which have already taken action to ban partially hydrogenated oils. But for those of you who don't live in North America, then I would recommend that you review the resources section below this video so that you can find out what the status of transfer policies looks like for your country of residence. And should you find out that your country hasn't yet eliminated these hard clogging fats from your food supply, then I would recommend that you do your absolute best to reduce your consumption of artificial trans fats, which is key to reducing your risk of heart disease from the dietary perspective. And so be aware that partially hydrogenated oils can also be an ingredient in many foods, such as baked goods like crackers, biscuits and pies, as well as packaged snacks, coffee creamers, frosting, dairy-free cheeses, microwave popcorn, including commercially fried foods, restaurant foods and street foods. Ultimately, when it comes to packaged products in general, make sure to always read the food labels, which includes carefully reviewing the packaging for any red flag terms such as refined, hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated so that you can make trans fat free choices for yourself and your family. Now, with that being said, the next important point to be aware of when it comes to industrial seed and vegetable oils is that they typically contain high pesticide residues, which are primarily designed to kill pests. However, science is showing us that chronic dietary exposure to pesticide residues can lead to hormone disruption, as well as brain and nervous system toxicity in people. And since our bodies can store toxins in fatty tissues, because most toxins are fat soluble, it makes sense that we should want to reduce our dietary exposure to toxic agricultural chemicals, but also do our best to support our body's natural detox processes, like helping the body to complete its daily detox routine, as you learned about in lesson one and lesson three. Now, one particular red flag chemical that has been raising a lot of concerns is glyphosate. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, glyphosate is the active ingredient in popular weed control products like Roundup, which is typically sprayed on many versions of genetically modified crops to wipe out weeds throughout the season. But it's important to be aware that glyphosate is also used on non-genetically modified crops like wheat, oats and beans. And because this is typically done late in the season to dry the crops so that they are ready to harvest sooner, then there is a higher chance that more glyphosate gets incorporated into our food supply. 
And the main reason why you don't want high glyphosate residues in your body is because chronic exposure to this toxic chemical has been associated with liver and kidney damage, as well as hormonal disruption and digestive issues. And you might also be interested to know that the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the World Health Organization, classified glyphosate as probably carcinogenic to humans. Now, the good news is that there are global intentions to ban or restrict glyphosate-based herbicides like Roundup, and so I would encourage you to find out what exactly the glyphosate-related situation looks like for your place of residence. So make sure to check out the resources section below this video for helpful links. And in the meantime, you can start protecting yourself and your family from chronic exposure to toxic agricultural chemicals by consuming foods that are less likely to contain pesticide residues, including glyphosate. So for those of us living in North America, this means avoiding genetically modified foods such as corn, canola, soy, etc., including other products like conventional snack bars, granola, oat breakfast cereal, and even the health food staple hummus, all of which can come with a high dose of glyphosate weed killer, which the Environmental Working Group helped us, the consumers, to uncover in their glyphosate testing series, which you can review in the resources section below the video as well. Now, another point to bear in mind is that you could give yourself extra doses of glyphosate and other toxins through the many ingredients in packaged foods. And so to give you an example, if you look at the common ingredients in conventional hummus, you will see that they contain chickpeas, of course. But we also know that chickpeas are one of the kind of beans that can be contaminated with glyphosate as per the EWG test series that I just talked about. Next, we have one of the red flag industrial seed oils, and we know now that soybeans are one of the top genetically modified crops in North America, so we can expect some glyphosate residues as well. Then we have citric acid, which is a food additive which is most often derived from corn, which as you know by now is also one of the genetically modified crops in North America. And finally, we have one of the most confusing food labels out there, which is natural flavors, which as you may remember, I described as sneaky in lesson two, because although natural flavors are derived from plants and animals to make processed foods taste real, natural flavors can contain up to a hundred chemicals, which are not disclosed on the ingredient label, which means that you could end up dosing on solvents, GMO derived ingredients, as well as flavor enhancers like MSG, which is designed to make you eat more than you should. Good, so I trust that what we've discussed so far is enough for you to see that many packaged foods can contain more stuff than you would like to put into your body. And so if you asked me how best to reduce your exposure to toxic agricultural chemicals, then I would suggest that you start focusing on certified organic foods. Not only because science is showing us that you can protect yourself from cancer by eating organic foods more frequently, but also because organic ingredients cannot be processed with the toxic industrial solvent hexane, which we talked about in the context of industrial seed oils, plus certified organic regulations prohibit any genetically modified ingredients in certified organic products, including synthetic pesticides like glyphosate. Ultimately, organic foods can help us reduce our exposure to toxic pesticides, synthetic fertilizers, synthetic hormones, antibiotics, as well as many toxic ingredients in processed foods. And so for this reason, I feel that voting with my wallet for cleaner, safer, more nourishing and natural foods is definitely worth the investment because I highly value my health and I'm willing to do everything that's necessary to keep it strong. So as a rule of thumb, for the sake of your health and well-being, I would suggest that you stay away from heavily processed industrial seed oils as well as industrially produced trans fats as much as you can. And if you asked me what fats and oils are best to focus on moving forward, then I would suggest that you keep it natural and simple, which for me personally looks like this. 
For cold cuisine, like salad dressings or drizzling over the food, I exclusively use extra virgin olive oil, which is the highest grade of olive oil made mechanically without the use of chemicals or excessive heat, which is important because factors like heat, oxygen and light accelerate the process of oxidation, which leads to rancidity, which ultimately reduces nutritional value and shortens the shelf life of vegetable oils. Which is why I get my extra virgin olive oil in dark bottles and in smaller amounts. And I also make sure to keep my oil bottle away from the stove because I understand that heat, oxygen and light are enemies of vegetable oils. Ultimately, what I really love about extra virgin olive oil is that it is one of the safest vegetable oils out there. It's time proven antibacterial, antiviral, rich in antioxidants, and simply the only kind of vegetable oil that you'll ever find in my kitchen. Next, for all other cooking needs, I always have a jar of pastured lard or pork fat, as well as raw coconut oil and some high quality grass fed butter. I love using these fats because they are very stable and perfect to meet my higher temperature cooking needs. I love to use raw coconut oil for baking, pork fat typically for light frying, and butter for all of the above depending on my mood and budget. Ultimately, I always look for high quality products, which means that I carefully check the food packaging for key information. So in the case of extra virgin olive oil, I look for the phrase extra virgin olive oil on the label and I ignore words like virgin, light, pure, including bottles that say olive oil only. Next, I search for the harvest and or milling date because extra virgin olive oil is best used within 18 months from harvest. And although some products list the best buy date, I prefer to know the actual harvest date since some bottles are labeled with a two to three year expiration date. And of course, I only consider extra virgin olive oil products that are packaged in dark bottles. And as a final example, I also like to see some third party certification to help me select the highest quality products. And you can check the resources section for more details on that. Now, when it comes to choosing my solid fat products, I look for keywords like unrefined, unbleached, pasteurized, non-deodorized, non-hydrogenated, as well as certified organic seals that are relevant for my geographical location. In addition, I love to support local farmers as much as possible, which is also a great way for me to ask any clarification questions about their products and practices. And I also like to be mindful of how I use my fats and oils because I understand that different cooking methods call for different choices. Plus, I like to make sure that I get all the nutritional goodness by using my fats and oils properly. That's why I personally choose not to use my extra virgin olive oil for cooking that involves heat, because I find that adding this oil to my dishes at the last moment, like drizzling over my steamed veggies and raw salads, or using it as a dip or as an ingredient in my homemade salad dressings, helps to retain the natural flavor of extra virgin olive oil, including its full content of antioxidants, which are so good for us. And I also feel that there is a lot of contradiction regarding the oxidative stability of extra virgin olive oil, meaning how exactly this oil reacts with oxygen when heated and what potentially harmful breakdown products are produced during the oxidation process, which actually involves a series of chemical reactions depending on the degrading factors that I already mentioned, such as temperature, light and oxygen. So. Until I'm fully satisfied with the whole oxidation story regarding extra virgin olive oil to meet my cooking needs involving heat, I personally prefer to use saturated fats, meaning natural fats that are solid at room temperature because I find them to be more heat stable and appropriate based on their chemical composition. So as you can see, I like to make my fat and oil choices from a place of awareness, understanding and based on what works best for my unique dietary and health related situation, which is what I always encourage everyone to do.
And so if you would like to get more information on how best to use the fats and oils that we just discussed, including their benefits, as well as some helpful purchasing tips, then check out the resources section below this video for my guide to fats and oils, including other links to help you buy the most authentic extra virgin olive oil out there. Good. So let's now close this lesson with the call to action, which is to reconsider your current fat and oil choices and tweak them in a way that's aligned with your personal health needs and goals. So this means diving into your fridge and pantry to carefully review the ingredient lists for any problematic fats and oils in your packaged products and ideally for the health of every cell in your body, show no mercy to toxic fats and oils. And as always, if you have any questions about this lesson, feel free to leave me a comment and I will do my best to reply as promptly as I can. That's it from me for today. Let's do this and I will see you in the next video.